Hello and welcome. I'm really pleased that you've joined me today as I think you're going to find today's conversation absolutely fascinating. It's with the Financial Times journalist and author, Robin Wigglesworth, who chatted with me from his homeland of Norway. Now, Robin is the editor of FT Alphaville, the Financial Times financial blog, where he blogs and tweets about the biggest trends reshaping markets and investing in finance across the world. He's also the author of a book called Trillions, which has taken the investing world by storm. Trillions been, has been described as the definitive book on the past, present and future of passive investing. I found it a truly riveting read and our conversation unpacks some of the humorous stories and anecdotes from the book that helped tell the story of index funds. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Robin Wigglesworth. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast, Robin Wigglesworth. Hi, Justin. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, really, I've been really looking forward to our chat, Robin, since we met in uh, London at the uh, Chicago, um, is it a school for business? I'm not sure. But anyway, it was a, you did a fascinating talk, um, introduced me to your book that I can't believe that I was unaware of at the time, and we'll get to a little bit later. But for those who don't know you, Robin, who, who are you and uh, what do you do? Well, so my name is Robin Wigglesworth. Uh, despite the kind of Harry Potter-esque name, I'm actually from Norway and I live in Norway still. Um, after you know many years abroad in the Middle East and London and, and the US and New York with the Financial Times, I still work at the Financial Times uh, where I was the global finance correspondent until recently. And I now lead uh, the Alphaville Finance Blog which is where the FT can be a little bit more irreverent, a little bit snarkier, a little bit punchier, uh, but still write about finance, markets and investing, generally speaking, all day, every wow. day throughout wow. the year. So um, I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but I have no idea how you timed it, the time you got to write your book, which is quite a heavy tome, but um, we'll get to that. <laughs> We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> now, I mean, where, where did this love of um, kind of love of, of of understanding finance come from? Um, by happenstance, really. I mean, like many journalists, you know, I, I studied politics and uh, history and wanted to be a war correspondent. Uh, but when I graduated from university in the mid two thousands, early two thousands. There weren't that many war correspondent jobs for, for newbie journalists, weirdly enough. Uh, but there were a lot of jobs in financial and economics and business journalism. And I knew a little bit about economics because I, I didn't realise you kind of need to, need to understand that, to understand how the world works. Uh, but my first job was covering finance in the Middle East, uh, weird enough, for a little trade magazine. And I just fell in love wow. with it because it felt like sort of drawing back the veil to how the world really works or... Rather than how it works, you, you understand how little you really know when you understand the world of money, right? Because it's always changing, but you suddenly see and understand so many other different world events, a little bit better at least, if you get money in economics and finance. And, you know, I, I did get to be a war correspondent briefly for the Financial Times. I covered the Arab Spring from Libya and Bahrain and wow. Egypt. Uh, but, uh, you know, finance was the, was the first cut. As Cat, St Cat Stevens said, the first cut is the deepest. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So, um, Robert, you know, you, you, you mentioned a couple of things there, which I think is really salient with our audience, which is, you know, I, I, I don't know my uh, many, many, many. Uh, well, I think we've got at least three uh, listeners to this podcast. Um, my mum, my sister and my, my, my wife. Um, but for the for the for the ones in addition to that, you know, making sense of their money when they're thinking about their retirement or they're in their retirement is 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 huge. And it appears to most people to be a really, really dark art. And and then even once they've kind of managed to wade their through wade their through the complexity of the tax system and the rules and regulations about accessing their own money, which they you know in their pension schemes and such like, um, they then got to get to this thing about investing um, and where they invest and what they do. Uh, and, and this seems to be the thing that you've really tried to unpack over the last few years. Well, I mean, these are, are hugely complicated issues. I mean, I often get asked for advice because, yeah, I've been writing about finance for a decade and a half now. 
And I just often have to shrug my own shoulders and say, look, I, I have a decent handle on high finance. But when it comes to, I mean, frankly, tax systems, I mean, that's just a whole different can of worms. Uh, so I have a lot of sympathy with anybody like me who has to navigate all this stuff. And for people who aren't versed in finance, it's particularly complicated. Um, but yes, I mean, I tend to write more on the, yes, the high financial side of things. So less what individuals should do. But I do hope that through my writing, some of these issues become clearer. And one of these sort of subjects I'm quite passionate about is the fact that, yes, people do sometimes get taken for a ride, either deliberately by some unscrupulous people or inadvertently by people that don't always know better than themselves and therefore end up having a less comfortable retirement than they maybe should have if you know they'd gotten the right advice earlier on in their life yeah, yeah. so let me bring me bring me to you uh, let's bring it your book in uh trillions which i have uh show the camera here um how a band of wall street renegades invented the index fund and changed finance forever Wow. I mean, you know, that's a great title. Um, and, the, and there's a few things there straight away that some people may not understand. And I know we have covered it on the podcast before. Um, but I I explain to me um, and our listeners, of course, uh, what is it? What is it about an index fund? What is an index fund? What? Why? Um, why was this such a revolutionary idea? Well, because it's so counterintuitive, right? I mean, in almost every other walk of life, you go to an expert to get things done. Uh, you don't basically crowdsource, uh, you know, getting your plumbing fixed. You go to a plumber and you go to a doctor if you have a medical ailment. And if you need your money managed, then you go to a professional money manager. And that's kind of how people have been doing it through centuries, though. In practice, the professional money management industry has only been around for 100 years or so. Um, and the index fund has only been around for 50. It celebrated its uh, 50th birthday in, 19, uh, in uh, 2021, born in 71. Um, and I think that's why it was so counterintuitive, the idea that you go to the expert to get the best outcomes. And also because obviously the industry had grown very rich and fat on the fees that customers pay it. So they weren't exactly keen to spread this wisdom either. I mean, can you imagine if somebody like a gym told you that you could, you know, get thinner and healthier by not going to the gym, as it were? I mean, they're not going to do that, right? They want you in through the door. And that's kind of what the index fund was. It's a way to get financially healthier by paying less and doing less. And that's not something the industry really wanted to hear. So it was kind of a, a secret that they fought quite vociferously against for, frankly, decades. Yeah, yeah. And so to contextualise it, of course, is that what we've got on one side of the fence is we've got these money experts who are going to advise you the the uh, the right um, uh, shares, in essence, uh, to, to buy and to hold um, and to buy and to sell and to buy and to sell. And then once once one's realize its true potential will then get rid of it and buy something else and of course these 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 experts are researching and they've got large um you know research desks that are analyzing and scanning all the details um but the, but something comes out of the wash doesn't it is that actually all that work and all that effort which we know of course in our world that we get rewarded for work and effort doesn't seem to hold true well, you can if you are one of the maybe couple of dozen people in the world that are the best at this. Uh, but there are very few of them. And frankly, they tend to charge so much for their services. And they are not for the likes of you and me. They are for the sovereign wealth funds, the massive biggest pension pots of money in the world, a few select life insurers and, and wealthy individuals and oligarchs. Uh, you know, the people that can do this or have demonstrated the ability to do this over time are very few and far between. And frankly, many of the people that we think can do this in reality are just there through sheer luck or probability. And this is not to say that they aren't hardworking, incredibly smart people. I mean, I, the smartest people I have ever met in my life work in finance. It's quite sad, really. But the industry sucks up an insane amount of brain power from every other walk of life because it's so well paid and they're incredibly hardworking. They work harder than I do. 
But still, on average, the outcomes are terrible. And it's not just sort of 50% do badly and 50% do well. Over time, roughly speaking, in most stock markets, for example, only 10% of fund managers, the professionals, manage to beat the market. And there are all sorts of really technical or big macroeconomic reasons for this. But it's just a demonstrable fact that we know. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, I think generally speaking, they charge too much for a pretty mediocre, shoddy service. And ideally, more people should save in an index fund that frankly does nothing more than buy all the stocks in an index. Albeit with a caveat that they need to pick the right index fund as well, because there is some snake oil in that industry as well. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, and of course, I think um, it would be very easy, wouldn't it, to think that, OK, if I if I am a fund manager and I have continually um, outperformed an index and I've continually selected the right securities, the right shares, the right investments to hold in my fund. And I've moved out at the right time and, you know, as the market's fall, fallen, I've moved out before that and there's the, and I've got into the right thing before it went up. That you know, there's an there's an inevitability that maybe if, if I've done that relatively consistency for five, seven, eight years, I'm going to start to think that I'm pretty good. Exactly. I mean, it's you know, hope springs eternal, and we tend to think that all our triumphs are thanks to our own ingenuity and hard work, and all our failures is bad luck and or somebody else's fault. And you know, it's it's just it's just unavoidable, really. Uh, but like you say, frankly, if you, I mean, this is the the um, example that Warren Buffett, the most successful investment manager in the history of the world, always uses. But if you get enough people together and flip a coin, you'll get a few people. If you get a few thousand people in a room, you know, a few of them will flip heads 10 times in a row. And it doesn't mean they're amazing coin flippers, even though they might think they have some special magic technique. It's just probability. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we see in investment management that, you know, you can be really good at this and you can frankly be have, be bad, have a bad run of luck or you can be frankly really abysmal money manager, but have an incredible run. And we've seen this. People have built up huge fortunes and being declared the geniuses of their era. And then suddenly every single dime they ever made for their investors gets wiped out in one big crash. Or vice versa, somebody who, frankly, calls everything right, seems to know have the right technique, but their timing is bad or something else happens. And, and that's why it's just very hard. And you should be careful of anybody who you know, comes and, and offers you um, uh, an alluring return stream. Yeah. I mean, the favorite example I have, which actually isn't in my book, but since I'm in Norway uh, now, it was actually a Norwegian TV program that once led, had pitched a, a bunch of astrologers, a couple of stockbrokers, a few beauty bloggers, and a herd of cows against each other in a stock picking contest. So all the different groups chose their stocks over a three month period. And the cows were led out in the field where they'd painted the tickets of every company on the Norwegian stock exchange. And where the cows defecated was their stock pick. <laughs> and the cows did as well as the professionals. Oh, gee. <laughs> but the most ingeniously, the, 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 the people that made the TV program won the contest. But how did they do so? Well, what they did is they, they picked 30 different portfolios. And then when the, the contest ended, they showed the best results. And this, is, uh, this was an experiment to show what we call survivorship bias. And this is what, frankly, a lot of asset managers or fund managers do, is that they don't show you the results of all the funds that they closed. They show you the result of the best performing one, which is why every fund manager in the world will always be able to show you a beautiful chart with lines going upwards towards the sky. But you should be very wary of that in practice. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, bizarrely... Um... If we look back at the data uh, of of an index, um, and I appreciate that we couldn't invest in all indexes, you know, as you might rightly said, we've only just separate celebrated um, fifty years of indexing from seventy one. But but if you could go back and look at the index, um, you know, S and P five hundred since the turn of the century, um, and and I appreciate that you'd have to reduce costs and trading costs within that, and we've only, so we've only got an index to go on, but. Actually, just the index return has, 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 would have served most people 
very well because of the compounding nature of it. Exactly. I mean, this is why I always say, look, the only, like I said, I get asked for advice all the time. And frankly, I see people smarter than me screw up all the time about this. So the only two pieces of advice I ever feel comfortable giving is that, you know, with some caveats, for example, investing in Russian stocks before the Russian revolution or Russia invading Ukraine, stocks tend to go up in the long run unless you happen to believe in a sort of a cataclysm scenario. And in that case, frankly, your investment returns aren't going to matter much anyway. Uh, stocks do tend to go up in the long run. So it's a very good long term way of saving money. It, it can be very volatile. So don't put money you might need next year into the stock market. But it's a good long term way of saving money. And the best way of saving money in the stock market is through index funds because they're cheap. And as you say, the returns compound over time, but the costs compound over time as well. So the difference between paying, let's say, 1% a year to a fund manager and 0.1% a year to an index fund is massive if you're saving over a 20, 30, 40 year time period. I mean, it will add up to, you know, quite a few extra holidays a year in your retirement versus where you might be otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So I've been a fan of... Um... I've been a fan of uh, indexing for a, for a while, but within your book, which I, I, I'm quite amazed at how you've turned what, what I would have thought a relatively dry subject, you know, index funds into quite a, a riveting read. I mean, it really is. I, I really do um, commend it to the audience. Um, but there's so many characters from the from the bet that you mentioned, Warren Buffett, the bet against um against any active manager to beat to beat the index over a 10 year period tell, like you cover that in the book tell me tell me a little bit about that story well I mean, the reason why i wanted to write the book and i frank felt it it needed or deserved a book was because of that so the reason why active managers still get so much press in frankly places like the financial times and elsewhere is because they're human and we humans love human stories. We like the drama. So if you want to call up Bill Ackman or Carl Icahn or Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio or, you know, the people at the Bailey Gifford Scottish Mortgage Trust, you, they can spin you a narrative about what they're doing and why. Why they're doing well, why they're doing badly, why they're buying this company, why they sold out of that company. It's understandable to us. But if you call up the manager of the Vanguard 500 fund, and ask him, why did you buy this and that? And he'll just say, it's, it's in the index, essentially. It's kind of boring. Mm. So that industry never has its rock star spokespeople, really, that you can call up for a good catchy quote that will come into the FT. Uh, but the more when I was writing about index funds, because frankly, it's just become so huge, we just need to recognize how powerful a force it's becoming financial markets. I started scratching around the genesis story of it and discovered that it was just filled with fascinating characters and that's what i wanted to tell but you know i start the book in the 19th century france and the people that kind of laid the first academic groundwork but that feels a little bit cruel to dump readers in some fin de siècle paris uh and financial theory so i open the book with this yes i i think this wonderful episode of this bet of the century between warren buffett uh and an investor in hedge funds and and Buffett, you know, is a famously the world's greatest investor, but he's always had a fairly jaundiced view of his own profession. He thinks it's just filled with mediocrities that extract rents uh, from ordinary people. And he got really annoyed in the mid 2000s at how many smart people are going to work at hedge funds. Now, people were talking about hedge fund this and hedge fund that. And he said, look, I bet you a million bucks that the index fund, the S&P 500 index fund, will beat any group of hedge funds you choose to pit up against it. And, and eventually there was an investor in hedge funds called Ted Sides, to his credit, thought, you know, the money's going to charity anyway. And quite astutely, he actually foresaw the financial crisis. So he thought a stock market index fund was going to do far worse than a hedge fund that can bet against the market as well. So he pitted a bunch of hedge funds up against the index fund. Uh, it was the Vanguard 500 fund. And as we know now, and I detail um, colorfully in, in the book, you know, the Vanguard 500 fund absolutely smashed uh, the, um, the, the, the hedge fund, the funds of hedge funds that 
uh, Ted Sides had chosen. I mean, this was, for a Liverpool fan, this was like Liverpool beating Manchester United 5-1 away and frankly <laughs> deserving a few more goals in it. It was just, it was embarrassing. Not a single one of those funds of hedge funds managed to beat the index fund. A few of them shuttered before the end of the decade. And it was just, yeah, it was just... Tate Sardis actually threw in the towel two years early because he so obviously he was going to lose. Uh, and I think it was quite a powerful message in, in what actually does work. That even when you get things right... Like I said, Ted Sardis is actually one of those smart, brilliant people I've met who I just... He, he's, he's incredibly cerebral and erudite and humble. And he actually did predict the financial crisis. And among those hedge funds he'd invested in was actually John Paulson, who made one of the biggest hedge funds holds in history by betting us a subprime crisis. And despite all that, the index funds still beat the hedge funds. And that was both because, generally speaking, Picking securities is very hard and hedge fund managers charge an ungodly amount of money for doing this job as well. So it's both performance, it's hard, and there are all sorts of technical reasons for that. And the cost of it is extremely high and that cost really does compound. It's a bit like, to stretch the football analogy, that you start every game 2 nil down. And if you have some brilliant strikers, maybe you can overhaul that deficit. But essentially, if you're investing with an active manager... You're starting every calendar year a goal or two down. And sometimes it might overcompensate, but in the long run, we know that's not a way to win championships. No, no. And in fact, um, you know, I've, I've just met with a client this morning with, um, you know, a couple of million pound portfolio that he's transferring over from a, uh, well, I won't mention the actual name, but um, quite, quite an active discretionary fund manager in the UK. And we calculated the costs and they are north of 2.5%, including all trading costs. And, um, you know, all fees for, for everything, custodian and the whole lot. But we've looked at the whole thing over the last 12 months, north of 2.5%. And when I actually look at it, it appears to be um, an index. But not an index, but but I a, a proxy index. I the 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 manager has picked, you know, um, sixty percent in the U.S., five percent in the U.K., you know, two percent in Germany, three percent in France. You know, it 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 appears to be a sixty forty, which is a classic kind of portfolio: forty percent of fixed income, sixty percent of equities, global funds, um, with nothing and with and with. Uh, not not so much even to a point of, um, right, I'm only going to cho choose 30, 30 companies to invest in and, and really nail my colours to the wall. But but there is, you know, there's there's, there's thousands of securities in there. Um, yeah, I suppose this is probably something you see on a regu regular basis. Uh, sadly, all too often. Uh, I mean, this has been a term I spend a lot of time going through the archives of the Wall Street Journal, Institutional Investor, Pension Investing, uh, the Financial Analyst Journal. And even back in the 60s and 70s, uh, even frankly before almost index funds existed, this was known as index hugging or, or, or closet indexing. Uh, and it's natural, right? Uh, and in many ways, that's what index funds or if funds started. I mean, a little bit of a recondite financial history, but the very first ever investment fund was a chest, a physical chest, where some Dutch merchants bought a bunch of bonds and stuck the contracts in and basically promised not to open the box for 30 years. Uh, and that was a passive fund, and it basically invested in all sorts of bonds that reflected the market. Um, but if you're basically doing that job, don't charge active fees for it. Yeah. I mean, at best, I think you're kidding yourself. At worst, you're being dishonest with your clients in a way that is very unfortunate. But we do know this happens. I mean, there's been various studies that show that index hugging or closet indexing is a phenomenon that waxes and wanes a little bit whenever there's more attention paid to it but especially in the retail space it is pernicious mm -hmm. and the only thing that really differs when you look at the index and or the overall stock market or the stock and bond market in a 60 40 fund and the returns is yeah the costs yeah. uh and it's i think is a shame 
But I, I look, I once talked to the head of one of the biggest asset management companies in the world, and even he admitted they did a recent look at the numbers. And just in the United States, there was eight trillion dollars worth of money that had was in funds that had underperformed over one year, two years, three years, five years, ten years, and fifteen years. And the money is just so sticky. People don't change. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's so hard, whether it's, you know, people saving for, you know, the kids going to university or their retirement, is that we don't want to spend time on our financial decisions or thinking about these things all the time. We don't switch our bank accounts as often as maybe we could or should. We don't check our change our mortgage providers, take, taking advantage of low rates all the time. And when it comes to investment products, you tend to pick something, and it's usually whoever that that very smart young man is saying is the best option, and you tend to forget about it for the next 20, 30 years until you are retired. And uh, it's a bit of a shame, but it's maybe an avoidable part of human nature. Sure, sure. Now, in your book, and I and um, I was very interested in the uh, the, the Dutch anal- the Dutch story that I read uh, I read uh, last night actually um, about the putting it all in the chest and um, and I loved some of the bonds that it was you know um, it was toll roads and things like that you know some nice recurring income streams which uh, I thought you know they'd, they'd be good for your portfolio. You cover a, uh, a couple of well numerous names in the book, uh, a couple of companies that I use a lot. Um, one being Vanguard, and uh, listeners to the podcast will know that I've talked about Vanguard and uh, Jack Bogle quite a lot uh, in past episodes. Um, but another fund manager that I use in um, all of my client portfolios, uh, a company called Dimensional Fund Advisors. They, they feature quite richly in the book. Tell me more about uh, your interest in them. Well, it's partially the the role that the founders david booth and, and rex sinkfield play in the history of index funds so i think dimensional is a fascinating company in its own right but i think it's its roots and its intellectual pedigree surpasses even you know the, the influence of the firm directly because rex sinkfield actually worked on one of the very first index funds when he worked at the um the bank the national bank of chicago uh, in in chicago in the early 70s and David Booth, who he went to Chicago University with around the same time, he actually worked on the very first index fund uh, under a guy called Mac McCrown in, in San Francisco in 1971. So I just think they were just fascinating characters in their own right. You know, David Booth came from, you know, middle of nowhere, frankly. He was a farm boy. Uh, you know, he told me he was when they moved to the big city when he was seven or something, it was a city of 4,000 people. And they had a third, a three-story building and he was taken aback by this massive structure. Uh, and Rex Sinkfield, you know, he, his father, you know, wasn't around. So his mother couldn't afford to pay for him and his, all his children. So she had to put him in an orphanage and he lived in an orphanage and for a period considered becoming a priest uh, until sort of the high finance came calling, as it were. So I think they're just fascinating people uh, that have, you know, incredible pedigree in the history of, of investing more broadly, really. So I think the index fund, I, the index fund is the hero of my book, but I try to use it as the prism to look at the entire history of investing over the past century, because I think there's so many interesting things going on. And there's been so many books written about banks, for example, uh, but financial markets and investing hasn't quite had the same sort of treatment. Um, and then they got together and I, I joke sometimes with friends and colleagues, it's kind of the Avengers assemble of the early index fund heroes, because it was Rex Sinkfield and, and David Booth, but then also Mac McCrown was on the board and the former teacher, Gene Farmer, they came together to form Dimensional Fund Advisors in the 80s. Uh, and they do indexing with the twists, as you know. Um, so not the sort of very plain vanilla style, all the stocks we could possibly cobble together in a broad plain vanilla index but you know they try and lean towards certain firms with certain characteristics like smaller firms that tend to do better over time or or cheaper firms that also do better over time yeah and then of course this is the point of course where isn't indexing actually becomes more complex (laughs) yes unfortunately and what what Vogel set out to do and uh and and, uh, you know or or going right back to the to the history books and uh, what, what what the intention of it actually indexing is has actually become a little bit more complicated because of course you know in today's world 
indexing. There are there is an absolute myriad, isn't there, of 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 of, of mutual funds, exchange traded funds, and and you can you can um, you can pretty much buy an index in anything nowadays. Exactly, and and this is the one thing I struggle more and more with these days. These days, I mean, like I said, I often give the advice that you know put money in the stock market for the long run and buy an index fund. But, you know, what's in a name? Would a rose by any other name smell as sweetly? And unfortunately, there are quite a lot of index funds that do stink. Um, the vast majority of money is in, yes, the, the plain vanilla index funds. Those are ones that track really big, well-diversified indices like the S&P 500, uh, the Eurofirst 300, the MSCI All World, for example. Uh, I'm deliberately not including the FTSE 100 for specific reasons uh, that you probably know very well, but it's not that diversified index, and it certainly isn't a good measure of the UK economy. Uh, it has mostly some big uh, natural resources companies. So I think the third leg of advice i give to people if they pry a little bit deeper is that you know just be careful about what you buy uh, because you know you can call anything an index i can slap three stocks together and say that's an index of three stocks and you know that's not really what people should be doing um but helpfully broadly speaking the biggest and cheapest index funds track the best indices so investing is a weird walk of life where you actually, the outcomes are better the less money you pay, which is a bit of a, a weird paradox, but it is true. But if somebody's saying, here's an index fund, it's going to cost you 1% a year, then you run for the hills um, because there are, the, there are twists to it. And then there's stuff in between that, frankly, dimensional fits in, which are factor funds or smart beta which is a, the sexy marketing term for it. And they are funds that, you know, have done a lot of research in seeing what tends to drive returns over time. And then you tilt towards them. And that doesn't mean you avoid, you just buy all stocks in one thing, but you tend to lean towards stocks that are cheaper, for example, and avoid more expensive stocks. Because broadly speaking, value stocks do tend to do better over time. And then you cobble that together into an index and it's the S&P 500 value index or the MSCI world value index, or for example, dimensional origin stories in small caps, smaller company stocks. Uh, so you buy all the smaller companies. Uh, the one issue I have with them is because the research is pretty much irrefutable. I do worry that in practice, whether you are you know, a person like me, or frankly, even a chief investment officer at a major pension plan or a sovereign wealth fund, humans are really bad at sticking out through the tough times. And the reason why a lot of these factors uh, do generate extra returns over time is because they come with a risk. You buy cheap, companies that are cheap are usually cheap for a reason. Smaller companies do generate higher returns, but they're riskier. They're smaller companies. Uh, so you do, do go through periods where these factors or dimensions, as dimensional likes to call them, just don't work well or, frankly, just bomb out completely. And the best example of that is value stocks. So value as a stock market driver did, frankly, quite badly since, let's say, 2010, 11, 12-ish. And then by 2019... It was just epically bad. So everybody thought, wow, value is definitely going to come back now. It's going to have a renaissance. And then coronavirus hit us. And value suffered what is the deepest and longest drawdown in human history. People have literally reverse engineered what might have been a value stock going back to the 1700s. And even you know during the American Civil War, uh, the Spanish-American War, never before has value stock have value stocks done as badly as they did in the basically 2010 to 2020 period. And now they're coming back. So 2022 was actually a really good period for value stocks, relatively speaking. But for me, you know, I saw a lot of people bail on value funds in 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, 
and then they miss the upside again. And that's why I, I think people should be wary that if they do go into these things, they need to know that they're willing to stick out and not bail uh, quite often at the worst possible time. Yeah. And of course, this is the point that I would counter with someone like me sit on the same side of the table as them. And of course, what we do is we blend our our value, our small cap, our profitability, our momentum indexes with broad based indexes. So so even if you've got a period of value not performing, you're, 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 that's not that is not the you know, your eggs are not all in one basket again. And then, of course, as and as value comes back. Um, probably means growth hasn't hasn't, and um, the money is shifting from growth to value. So of course it's putting together a, pl- a, a, a what I would hopefully a clever portfolio, an academically portfolio, and actually sit with the clients and go, look, this is this is normal, this is okay. Uh, um, you know, um, as I've always said, we're never going to make you a killing, but we're not going to get you killed, and that's the key. <laughs> that's the, exactly the way to do it. And think about it: you, you're building a portfolio. And frankly, sometimes if having somebody holding your hands and saying it's going to be OK is frankly one of the most valuable things you can do, because we do know that actually ordinary investors do badly in the long run, not just because uh, they choose bad funds or they choose bad stocks, but they also tend to panic or they, they drive in herds. And having a sensible person there to sort of calm you down is actually a helpful thing. It's frankly the one service that active fund managers tend to undersell because it sounds so bad but the one valuable service i do think they do provide is that some people like having a human fund manager they can praise or or castigate when things go badly or 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 they do go well i think that is actually something that's valuable we were humans and it's one of the reasons why i'm always been a little bit more reluctant about some of the the people without advice or knowing what they're buying go to buy an ETF on some sort of fund supermarket, for example, and go to the ETF that's done the best over a certain period of time. And for example, they would have bought a a growth stock ETF that did phenomenally in the decade up to 22. And then basically now has, you know, had multiple years of returns just wiped out in one of the biggest growth stock uh, market setbacks in history. Um, so, yeah, I think com- combining these factors in a judicious portfolio and with like somebody holding your hands is is the right way Absolutely. to go about it. So, Robin, um, uh, I hear from you often through FT Alphaville. Um, obviously, we can get your book. Tell me where people can find you, where they can hook into what you're saying and um, and, and where they can get a copy of your book. Well, the copy of my book they can get from most booksellers. I'm certainly at Amazon, but also Waterstones and uh, and elsewhere, um, Daunt Books covered it, uh, have uh, had it quite prominently, which was very kind of them. I think it's uh, it's published by Penguin, I think, isn't it? Yes. Yes, Penguin. Penguin UK in the UK, Penguin in, in the US. Uh, and you'll soon be able to read it in Taiwanese, South Korean, Japanese, Chinese, and a few other languages. Um, and you know where they can read my stuff. I mean, I'm actually privileged to work at the one free part of the FT. It's a secret I'll share with your listeners, but don't tell too many people <laughs> about it. But, you know, the FT is egregiously expensive, which I'm glad for because it helps pay my my woeful journalist salary. But FT Alphaville is actually free. We just keep it secret that it's free. All you need to do is register with an email and you can read it for free. And I write about a lot of these issues there, albeit more from a, a snarky point of view rather than sort of a personal finance view. Um, and when it comes to contacting me, I'm obviously on email, but you know, Twitter, I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist and I'm a slave to social media. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I hate it, but I spend a prodigious amount of time on Twitter, uh, to my family's immense consternation. Uh, but yeah, and I talk to people there all the time. So definitely hit me up there if you have any questions. Um, and chances are, you know, whatever time of the day it is, I'll probably be logged on and reading and answering. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I really appreciate your time this afternoon. It's been fascinating talking to you. Um, I love meeting to you. I love meeting you in um, in London that time. And um, hopefully we can uh, see each other again soon in the flesh. Uh, but I really appreciate your time this afternoon. No, no, thanks, Justin. Thanks for a phenomenal interview. I really enjoyed it.
Thanks once again to Robin for joining me today. To follow Robin's views and commentary on FT Alphaville, check out the show notes on our website for that link. And also some other links, including how to connect with Robin and buy his book. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, as it really does help more people like you find us. And for more interviews and retirement planning videos, you might want to check out my YouTube channel. Just search for Justin King MFP or click on the link in the show notes. And of course, if you want to get in touch, you can reach me on hello at the retirementcafe.co.uk or on Twitter at Justin King CFP. So until next time, I'm Justin King, helping you feel more informed in your retirement.